Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the last seminar of the semester. Um, I'm super, super happy that Phil uh, Philip Pisola is here with us today. Uh, it's um, an incredible opportunity to hear from someone who does uh, very cool research, as probably every one of you knows. Phil is one of us. He's faculty in the EECS department at MIT. And um, um, that's like great research and the interconnection between uh, generative modeling and um, um, computer vision, machine learning, graphics, um, and uh, representational learning. And uh, this is actually not Phil's first rodeo at MIT, right? He uh, graduated from MIT with his PhD from the Department of uh, Brain and Cognitive Sciences back in 2015, working with uh, Ted Adelson and Odd Oliva. Um, and uh, before coming here, he spent um, a few years at Berkeley as a postdoc and one year at OpenAI, I think. Um, um, a time that was like um, he great, like he did like uh, really impactful um, contributions in the area of image to image translation. Um, so um, great work, uh, but he's not here to talk about that work. He's here to talk about um, mental imagery, that sort of fundamental capacity that we have to sort of imagine pictures in our head, right? So just like picture something and then just being able to spin it in your head, being able to uh, think about it, and um, how that um, relates to robotics and how, um, 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 how we can think about it from the perspective of uh, NERF uh, uh, in particular. So it's great to have you here, Phil. Thank you for making the time. Um, please. OK, great. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alberto. So uh, and of course, I should mention that what I'm going to present um, is all also with Alberto. So, <laughs> so I think you, you know the story, but um, yeah, I, I, I think I'll present it my own way, too. Hopefully, you'll, you'll get something out of it. Um, but yeah, it's great to be here and talk about this work, Giving Robots Mental Imagery. And this is work that really is um, all led by my student, Yan Chen Lin. So uh, this, this might be similar to his thesis talk at the end of this year, uh, but it's my chance to get to talk about his work. OK, because he's the student in my lab that's really been leading for the last several years the robotics efforts. OK, so what I want to start with is what exactly is mental imagery? So mental imagery is the term that psychologists have for the pictures you see in your head. You know, not everybody has the same degree of um, vividness of mental imagery, but a lot of you, if you close your eyes, you can imagine something. You kind of see the photo in your, in your head. You imagine your best friend. You can see their face in your head, right? And even for folks that don't have as vivid a mental image, psychologists think that we use um, in you know, some internal process the ability to kind of hallucinate picture-like elements in our head to solve reasoning tasks. So one of the famous studies that demonstrated that was this one from uh, Shepard and Metzler in 1971 on mental rotation. And what they did is they asked the participants in the study to look at these two shapes and um, answer whether they are the same shape or not. So why don't you try that in the audience right now? Uh, what do you think? Are these two shapes the same under some rotation? So can you rotate one of the shapes to be the same as the other shape? OK, so think about that for a second. So who thinks that, the, uh, from your perspective, the left shape is the same as the right shape? Actually, left and right don't matter. But who thinks they're the same? So raise your hand if you think they're the same. OK, who thinks they're different? OK, everybody thought they were different. There were one or two people that weren't quite sure, but that's fine. Uh, they, are, they are different in this case, but it's a little bit hard to see. So can anyone tell me what your reasoning process was? How did you try to answer that question? What were you doing mentally? Anyone, any volunteer, tell me how you did it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I first tried uh, rotating the image on the right such uh -huh. that uh, each of the bottom two points were down, sort of, so 90, I guess 90 degrees uh, in either direction, and then noticed that the, the three block uh, middle portion uh, could not correspond to the three block middle portion on the image yeah. on the left. OK, great. Yeah, so I think that the key word um, there is you kind of imagine the shape rotating. You imagine this physical process. And that's what people tend to do, and that's what they reported in their experiment. Uh, so here are some examples of two different shapes. 
that may or may not be the same shape. And the, the participants seem to actually imagine the physical rotation process. And if you look at their reaction time, so how quickly they were able to answer whether or not these are the two shapes, as a function of the angle of rotation between the two shapes, for the case when they are the same shape, then there's this linear relationship. So the bigger the rotation angle in 3D, the longer it takes you to say if they're the same. And that seems to suggest, according to Metzler and, and Shepard, that you're actually rotating this picture, this three-dimensional object in your head. OK, so there's been a lot of studies that um, kind of qualify those statements, and, uh, but confirm you know, to, to, to the most part that we do really seem to use these mental images to do reasoning. Uh, here's just one more example. This is from Coslin in 1983. So he showed participants a photo like that and said, uh, memorize the location of the elephant and the lighthouse and the other elements, and then took the photo away, the, the cartoon away, and asked them questions like, how far is the lighthouse from the elephant? And it seemed like the participants were scanning in their memory of this picture across that distance. And so again, you had this linear relationship between the reaction time, how long it took to answer the question, and the distance between these two landmarks in your memory, and in fact, in the actual cartoon. OK, so that's the idea of mental imagery, pictures in our head that we use to help ourselves do reasoning. And the subject of this, ta uh, of this talk is going to be, can we give robots mental imagery to aid their spatial reasoning ability? OK, and that was all very classical stuff. The thing we're actually going to use is going to be very current stuff. It's going to be neural radiance fields, NERFs. So what exactly is a NERF? This is a demo that William Shen and, and Ge uh, Yang made. And um, this is a robot that they have downstairs, George the Robot. And uh, I think Will went around and took a bunch of photos, 70 photos of this robot. And they look like this. So he's just walking around with a cell phone, different photos, 70 photos like that. Uh, once you have all that data, what you can do is you can fit a model to that data, a NERF so-called model to this data, and it gives you an output that looks like this. OK, so it allows you, this is a hallucination of a neural net model, uh, and it allows you to synthesize what would that scene look like from any, any particular viewing angle. So we had only 70 randomly sampled viewing angles, but the model is able to interpolate smoothly to create this kind of full 3D experience of that, that light field. Uh, what does it look like from any angle? Uh, so basically, you're modeling all of the light content in a volume. OK, so that's what a NERF is. Let me tell you in a little bit more technical detail, if you haven't seen these before, how they work. So um, they represent a scene, a volume of photometric content, as a mapping from a coordinate grid to a, another grid of uh, colors and densities. So on the left, we have our input to, to this mapping, which is just uh, a coordinate grid. So you know the x is one dimension, the y is another dimension, the z is another dimension. And in fact, they can have a five-dimensional coordinate grid. It's going to be the three-dimensional location of every point in the space. That will be three of the coordinates. And then also the angle, uh, the two-dimensional angle on a, on, a, on a sphere, so the theta and phi angle of looking into that space at some particular angle. OK, so that's a five-dimensional uh, coordinate that will then map to a color value if I looked at that location at that point, what would, I, what would I see? And you also augment that color value with a density. So that's like an occupancy. Is it just free space or is it actual occupied space? OK, and this big fee is a, typically a neural net. So in fact, uh, one way to think about it is it is a, a neural net that takes in the coordinates and outputs a color. And here I'm just showing XY mapping to luminance as a simple example. So we'll sample an XY location, and we'll map it to the luminance at some location. And then we'll slide that neural net across that entire coordinate volume. So that's just a convolutional operation. This is a big conf net. That's all it really is doing. Uh, it, so the convolutional filters are these little, tiny, these, uh, these little tiny networks that are then slid all over that coordinate volume. OK. So that's how neural uh, radiance fields represent the photometric content in a volume. And in order to render that volume into a photo, you can simply uh, project the uh, information in the volume onto a particular viewing plane. And that's done by volumetric rendering. So you're actually taking an integral along the line to say what is the color at that point in the image. And an integral along this line uh, will tell you the color of all the points in this image. Okay. OK, so, so NERF is a system for representing what the scene would look like from any angle by representing the photometric content in this volume, which is uh, 
itself represented as a mapping from a coordinate grid uh, to the volume parameterized by a neural net. So I'd like to, this looks a little complicated, I'd like to think of it as just like a 3D representation that we traditionally would work with, a point cloud or a mesh, except um, making use of a few little changes here and there, like a neural net that parameterizes that 3D information as opposed to just a kind of array of uh, coordinate values. Okay, so it's a new kind of 3D representation. It has some nice properties. The entire process is differentiable. So you can differentiate from the image all the way back to the volume, all the way back through this neural net that represents the scene. Okay, so that's a nerf. And um, we're gonna be using those for robotics. So they've been used in graphics all over the place. They're really exciting. We're gonna use them for robotics. And uh, essentially, the way that I, that I like to think about this, this whole setup is that we start with a data set, which is a, a lot of photos of a scene. And then we train a NERF to fit um, a NERF volume such that any, uh, so when I look at that volume from a particular camera angle, I will end up seeing what I see in my data set. Uh, so there's a modeling process, and then we get our model out. And <clears throat> sorry, this is not plain. Yeah, there, there we go. So you might think at first from a graphics perspective, what was the point of that? We had a lot of photos. We can make beautiful photos just by sampling from our photo set. And now we get this thing where we can hallucinate new photos. It doesn't really look like we got much out. Uh, but I like to, to think that what we got out is actually something more powerful than we put in. The uh, model's representation of that content has some properties that make it more powerful than just a collection of photos. So you get this kind of virtual camera out, which is better than a regular camera. Uh, if you've seen me give talks recently, I like to talk about models fit to data as being better than data. They're like data plus plus. Okay, so let's see how, how NERF as a virtual camera, as this data plus plus object can actually improve robotics. And another way of phrasing that question is what good are mental images for robots? So we'll talk about three projects. Uh, these are all projects led by Yen Chen. So the first is going to be using NERFs in a render and compare pipeline for uh, post detection. And then we'll talk about um, using these NERFs as a way of sampling synthetic data that can be training data for a dense object descriptor. And the last one will be uh, using NERF as kind of a virtual camera that can re-render a scene in a way that makes it easier to do affordance estimation. Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into the robotics content, but any questions about NERF before, before I dive in? I think a lot of you have seen it before. Okay, if you haven't, it's, it's just a wonderful new format for 3D data. Okay. So the first project is uh, post-detection. It's a method that we call iNERF, inverting neural radiance fields for post-estimation. And this was uh, published at iROS uh, with, again, Yen Chen as the lead author, uh, but a lot of colleagues at Google uh, involved as well. Okay, so I'll show you, I'll tell you exactly what this means. But in this project, essentially we thought about NERF uh, as being a mapping from some camera controls to a photo. So we thought of those camera controls as kind of like latent variables that are input into this neural network or this entire NERF system that can render what would the scene look like from that angle, right? So remember that the NERF is this mapping from a, a coordinate grid, x, y, z, theta, phi, and you can then render what a, an image would look like from any particular camera angle. Uh, so we can manipulate the camera angle, the, the viewing direction, theta or phi, and we will end up getting an image which rotates. So this is you know, a way of rendering, but could we instead try to infer the latent variables given the observed image? And that if we invert this process, infer the latent variables that generate an image, then this can become a method for estimating the camera pose, which is also equivalent in this case to estimating the object pose. So here, here's the basic idea. We have an observed image, which is the fork, and we have our NERF, which is represented what this particular fork would look like on that particular background from any, any potential angle. And now we can simply search in Z space, in the latent variable space, for the uh, camera direction, which is one of the latent variables, that will match the observed image. Okay, if I wanna make this generalized not just to the fork on that particular background, you do some background masking. So in the, in the uh, actual experiments, we do this background masking. So now 
I have my model, my mental model, my mental image of what the fork will look like under any rotation. And if I see the fork under a new rotation, I can estimate what its rotation is by just searching over my mental model to find you know, how would I have to look at it, what angle would I have to look at it in order for it to match what I'm currently seeing. And that will tell me exactly what the pose of the fork is. Okay, and this, this, this can get you, um, yeah, an estimate of the entire pose. Yeah. So in the George video, uh, yeah. the, the 70 images from George, you have to understand where the camera is in order to do the training. So yes. why isn't every Nerf pipeline already estimating camera pose with some structure from motion or something? So, uh, so typically, the, the original Nerf took camera pose as input, so you have a set of posed images, and that goes into the optimization. And now the more recent ones actually jointly optimize over the camera pose for unposed images and the Nerf model. Uh, and they jointly optimize it in a way that's using basically the same math as we're going to do here. So they're going to infer those latent variables jointly with the neural net mapping. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that this work influenced that a little bit, because uh, that came after. OK. Uh, so just a little bit more detail. How do you actually estimate the camera pose? How do you infer latent variables that, that render to an image that matches your observation? Well, you use backpropagation because everything here is a differentiable function. Most of it is neural net. And uh, that means we can simply define a loss function, which is we have our observed image of that fork. Uh, we have our synthesized mental image of the fork. We can define a loss, which is just the difference between those two things. And we can then backprop to find the estimated pose of the camera such that if I cast rays from that pose and then integrate through the nerf volume, I will get the colors that I'm seeing. That's essentially what this is saying. Uh, one little trick here is that we're not going to render entire images because that's kind of slow, or it was slow at the time. So we're only going to sample uh, a few pixels in order to uh, estimate our, our gradient update. Uh, so we'll just, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at that, that fork, maybe I'm only going to sample a few points on that fork, and that will tell me, am I currently matching my observation or not? And then if I'm not, I'll update my parameters to match it better. OK, so that's just a speed up trick. And here's what it looks like in practice. So this is gradient descent, backpropped all the way to the parameters of that camera. The camera is the frustrum on the right uh, in this diagram. And so you're moving your mental image around via backprop. And this is what you're seeing. This is your mental image. And you can, uh, the overlaid frame is the observation in the world. And you're imagining you know, what that object would look like under your mental image. Uh, at all these different angles. Uh, the error is just you know, the mismatch between these two things, the MSC, the pixel-wise mismatch between these two things. Backprop it back, and it will align. And this will work uh, decently well as long as you're within around like 30 degrees of the ground truth uh, pose. If, you're, if your initial conditions, where your initial estimate of the camera is like 180 degrees opposite of the true position, then um, this thing won't converge. But as long as you initialize your guess of the pose within you know, a decent uh, bound, like 30 degrees. This will work pretty well. OK. So this, this works decently well on a, a, you know, a variety of different objects. As you can see, the background is masked, so you just know what this object looks like under any rotation. Uh, but it doesn't matter what the, is, what, what the background is. And we observe some pose of the object, and we will do gradient descent. And this is the frames of gradient descent. Uh, step by step iterative optimization to align your mental image with the with the observation. Okay, uh, this also works decently well for scenes. So you can do things like SLAM, where you're trying to estimate the location of a camera within a room. The idea is that I've trained a Nerf on a room as my uh, my office, let's say, and so I know exactly what that room should look like. And now a robot is trying to localize itself within that room. So we will just search over all the different possible views of my room given by Nerf in order to find the one that matches what the robot currently sees. And the optimization process looks like that. And eventually, I've located myself within the room if I'm this, if I'm this robot. OK. Uh, so here's a, a real demo of something that you can do with this, this system. Uh, so Yenchen's going to take this toy car. He has a Nerf model of that toy car. Uh, the Nerf model is actually given by just a single photo of the car that then gets sent to a system called pixel nerf, which infers a nerf from a single photo. So you just need one photo of that car. You will then uh, estimate with this off-the-shelf pixel nerf system a full nerf of the car. And then you will uh, infer the pose of the car 
using iNERF. And as Yenchen moves the car around, uh, you can see the estimated pose is moving uh, fairly accurately. And I'm not gonna go too much into the numbers, but this is actually competitive with you know, state-of-the-art methods on pose estimation. So one is called superglue, it extracts features, it tries to estimate the pose of the object, and this method is working uh, better in this case. Okay. Okay, so this is a very simple algorithm actually. We're just inferring the camera pose that will render to the observed image, and that tells us the object pose. So, so um, that's the end of the iNERF project. Before I move on to the next project, any questions? Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, so when you, if you think of the alignment problem as kind of three uh, main angles of rotation on your like three axes of degree of freedom, then chances are you probably have multiple trajectories that can converge to the same pose. So during yeah. experiments, is the optimization results <coughs> consistent in terms of the trajectory of rotation? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we have any experiments that directly address that, other than saying that if your initial initialization of your pose is very far off, it doesn't converge, or it converges to a different local minimum. So you have to be within that kind of basin of uh, close to correct. And as long as you're in that basin, I think you could take different paths uh, through that, that energy function and, and um, they, they wouldn't necessarily be the same. I don't know how similar they, they would end up being. Yeah? Any, like, um, I guess, exploration into the idea of having like a translation mismatch in addition to a rotation mismatch? Yeah, so it is actually searching over both translation and rotation. Yeah. So it's searching over um, the x, y, z, theta, phi. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Question. Um, in the applications that you showed, do you know how important the um, direction dependence of the radiance field is? Like, if you'd done it with just the x, y, z, yeah. um, does it would it still work, or do you really need the um, the direction dependence? Uh, I don't know if we ever tried that. That's a great question. I think that there could be reasons why that you would want that, or you wouldn't want that. You you would want that because if I uh, you know can more accurately localize something that's specular that has direction dependent lighting effects. As long as my lighting and my material properties are the same at, in my NERF model as in my observation. But if the lighting changes, now all these specularities won't be consistent with my NERF model and it might have been better to actually have a NERF model which is uh, not modeling specularities but just uh, some more robust features that don't change when you change lighting. So. Yeah, I, I think that we always had the angular dependency and we were only looking at the case where you really kind of have the same lighting conditions or sufficiently similar lighting conditions at training time of the nerf and at post estimation time. Uh, but that would be interesting to explore more. Okay, so maybe one more, one last question then I'll move on to the next. Oh, sorry, no, okay, I thought I saw a question there, no. Uh, it, it's sort of related, okay, I guess, yeah. about the metric you're using for the loss. Mm -hmm. So you said it's MSE, but yeah. maybe regarding like lighting changes, other, were there other metrics you explored, like intersection of the or something? Yeah, um, I don't remember if we explored any other metrics or if Yenchen explored any other metrics. I think we didn't go very far into that, but the one big thing about the, um, the metric is it's only based on sampling a subset of the rays, so not rendering the whole image, and the subset that's sampled is sampled based on a heuristic of where you think the loss is gonna be large. So that does kind of affect uh, how you calculate that metric. You're only trying to sample on the surface of the object, not sample in empty space, because that won't really contribute to your, your gradient update. Uh, okay, but maybe we used L1 or some robust metric I can't really remember. Okay, so let me now move on. All, all three of these sections are gonna be basically using the same machinery. It's all gonna be trying to use manipulations of your mental image via NERF in order to estimate spatial properties and collect spatial training data. But the next one is gonna be focused on thinking of this thing as a way of collecting synthetic data. And it's gonna be synthetic data that will then cha uh, train a downstream uh, computer vision algorithm. Okay, and this is called NERF supervision because we're using NERF as a way of collecting supervision or training data for another algorithm. And uh, this has also worked with the same team at Google, uh, Pete Florence, John Barron, Sung Yi Lin, and uh, Alberto and me. Okay and again, led by Yenchen. Okay, so uh, the task in this project was to do 6DOF pick and place. So 
uh, the times, types of interactions that Yenchen is doing here, and then have a robot be able to imitate what he does. And we chose these types of objects because these are optically difficult objects. These are objects that traditional 3D representations don't handle very well, but it turns out that nerfs are really great for these types of uh, challenging optics where there's specularities and transparencies because it, 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 it actually handles those quite well. Uh, so just to uh, demonstrate that the previous methods don't handle these types of objects very well, so what is a traditional 3D representation? It would be to have a depth camera that looks at the scene and extracts a depth map and fits a mesh to it, things like this. And if we do that here, and we have a depth camera, and we look at that scene, well, here's what the depth camera sees. It actually gets super confused by all the specularities and the thin, thin elements. So the tines of the fork are stuck to the, uh, the surface of the table, and they're not actually accurately modeled. OK, so for this type of data, uh, a lot of the past approaches to uh, modeling the three-dimensionality of the scene don't work. Uh, NERF has a slightly different way of doing it, and it actually handles these cases quite well. That's been the story in graphics. And so we wanted to see if that will then aid us in robotics as well when we have objects like this. OK. So uh, in, in the NERF supervision pipeline, there are three steps. And the first, again, is going to be to optimize a NERF of an object. So if I want to learn a representation of an object, the first step will be to collect a lot of cell phone photos of that object and then fit a NERF to those photos. OK, so here Yan Chen is walking around in a circle. Uh, you know, again, we used to have to have these posed perfect photos. Now you can just use your cell phone and jointly estimate everything. Um, he takes about 30 or 50 photos like that and then fits a NERF to that data. OK. So this is using this you know, depth supervised NERF, so it actually has some information from uh, an, est uh, 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 an actual estimate of monocular depth. But anyway, the details aren't too important. Just use your off-the-shelf best current NERF method, and you can then render what this thing would look like from any angle. And another interesting thing is the NERF, uh, because you're representing this density over the volume, this RGB and then density, uh, from that density, you can actually get a, um, a 3D volumetric representation and get a depth map out of that. So NERF actually gives you a depth map as well. OK. So it's supervised a little bit with depth, but then it gives you a better depth map as the output. OK, once you have that type of data, we're going to say, wait a second, that is exactly the kind of data that we need in order to train view invariant computer vision algorithms. So a lot of computer vision algorithms, they want to have multiple views of the same thing so they can learn a representation that is invariant to how I'm viewing an object. No matter how I rotate the object, I want an invariant feature descriptor. And this is exactly the kind of data you want, this ability just to look at an object from different views. Uh, you also need that all the views are in correspondence. So I need to know for every pixel in one view, what are all the other corresponding pixels in the other views. So where does the end of that strainer appear in every single image? And if I have that correspondence, that's exactly the kind of supervision that we need for um, a popular class of algorithms, which I'll describe next. OK. But before I describe that, let me just tell you how, from the NERF, I get the dense correspondences. Uh, it shouldn't be too surprising, because if I have this model of the full volume and I, and, I, and I know the camera angle looking at the volume from one direction the other direction, I should be able to do some kind of triangulation, right? And that's exactly what you can do. So you can take part of the strainer here, and we can click on a point, the, the, the pink point here, and then we can show what is called the epipolar line in the other camera view, because we know exactly the camera um, coordinates that render this image and the camera coordinates that render that image. We know the x, y, z, theta, phi for each of these two images because that's how we rendered them. And that means that it's just a simple uh, geometry problem to identify you know, for one ray through one camera, where will it appear in the view of another camera? And that geometry problem is called epipolar geometry. OK, so here is the ray that corresponds to shooting a laser through that pink pixel. And now all we have to do is find where this ray intersects the object. And NERF has this depth map. It has this density function. And so what you can do is you can simply look where that ray will um, intersect a region of high density. And you could just take the first region of high density that's intersected. And that, that would work all right. Uh, what 
we found is it works slightly better if, because NERF's representation of geometry is kind of fuzzy, it works slightly better to have a probabilistic way of sampling from, from this, um, where this ray might intersect. So you, you sample in proportion to the probability of the ray terminating at every single location along that path. Okay, so we have two potential correspondences between the clicked on point in this view and these two points in the other view. And we simply add both of those uh, correspondences in proportion to their probability to our correspondence training set. And then we're gonna use that correspondence training set in order to train a, um, a computer vision system. Okay. Okay. So the final step is to train the computer vision system. And this one is going to use another wonderful piece of technology that's become popular in recent years, which is called contrastive learning, which many of you will have heard about. In particular, we're using the contrastive learning method from uh, Russ and his students, Dense Object Nets. Okay, so in, in their work, they had a robotic, uh, a robot that took photos that were in correspondence mechanically because the, the robot actually moved just, just to the right positions and it had a depth camera, it had all this kind of machinery. Now we just have our NERF and that's virtual data where everything is already through optimization of the NERF been put into correspondence and we're using that as synthetic virtual data uh, for the same purpose. So here's, here's how it works. We take one part of the object and then we hallucinate in our mental image, in our NERF, what would that part of the object look like under a different uh, camera view? And here's what it would look like. Okay, we're using all that epipolar geometry to identify where that green point will appear in each different camera view. And now this becomes a positive pair for a contrastive learning algorithm. So what that means is we're going to train another neural network, F, which looks at these two patches and embeds them to the same feature vector because they correspond to the same point in 3D space under different views. And in contrastive learning, it's called contrastive because we will also say that a different part of the scene, which corresponds to a different 3D location, randomly sampled, should map to a different point in representation space. So we call these positives as two views of the same 3D point, and these are negatives, two views of two different 3D points, and the positives are aligned in representation space, and the negatives are unaligned, are, are spread apart. And now we have a feature representation after training this neural net F that will be invariant to how the camera looks at the object and only depend on the actual um, kind of intrinsic geometry and content of the scene. Okay. So here's what that looks like. Here are the forks, and here are the feature descriptors on the bottom. The top is just a segmentation map. You can do an off-the-shelf segmentation. Okay, so what I want you to notice is that the colors of every pixel, those are colors that represent the feature descriptor of that pixel, and the colors stay stuck to the geometry. So when we move the forks around, notice that the colors stay kind of stuck to the surface of the geometry because they're invariant, these descriptors, as indicated by the colors, are invariant to the pose of the object. Okay, so notice that the tines of the fork are always kind of orange, and the stem of the fork is always kind of purple. Okay, and what that means is then I could track key points. I can say, track the stem of the fork, so basically track the purple feature vector, and we're just visualizing it as key points now, and you can imagine that this would be very useful input to all kinds of manipulation algorithms. Uh, so we tried just one manipulation algorithm, a 6DOF pick and place fit to imitation uh, data. Okay, so what, what does that mean? That means that we are going to be tracking these feature points. Uh, Yen Chen will demonstrate picking up the stem of the fork and placing it in a new location, and then the robot can, uh, can uh, do the same thing when the fork is in potentially a new pose. It will just imitate picking that key point that was demoed. Okay, so now the forks are in... Uh, a test, unseen test pose, and the robot's gonna come in, and it will always pick the, pick the stem because the imitation training data has, by Yen Chen, has told it pick, pick up that stem point. Okay. So this can do 60 of manipulation uh, because we are actually tracking, you know, three key points that tells us, you know, the angle of the fork, not just the position of the fork. Okay, and yes, I'm told that this is the proper etiquette. I'm not 100% sure, but. Got it right. Okay. Um, 
So one nice thing about using these contrastive learning methods and neural net feature embedders is that they'll generalize a little bit. You can train the system on one fork, it'll generalize to a slightly differently sized fork. That's kind of the, you know, the magic of uh, deep learning and what you get out when you start to, to uh, learn feature representations. Okay, one more, one more example. I'm told that this was the motivation of the project, was Yen Chen was eating, uh, uh, having a lot of hot pot and wanted to see if a robot could help him. And, so he realized that these objects are just can't be handled by regular 3D representations, but they can be handled by NERFs because NERFs are really only, um, you know, they're optimized to, to render the, the scene but not necessarily have all the geometry quite right. Okay, and so we'll render the, the scene to create training data for another algorithm, and there it goes. Okay, so that was using NERFs to collect aligned and correspondence training data for another algorithm. So let me pause there before going on to the final, the final project. Any, any questions there? Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, for the evaluation test, are you guys are still using stereo depths? Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, I think it still uses stereo depth because there is a depth ambiguity, and so you use the stereo to know how, like, what the depth is, yeah. Okay. So, uh, how are you segmenting the object from the background? Um, so that part is using, I think, mask RCNN, and it's um, just off-the-shelf, you know, segmentation, fine-tuned on the forks. Yeah. So all, these systems always have a lot of like little moving pieces, like stereo and mask RCNN, but those are more like existing technologies. Yeah. Okay. One more, more and then I'll move on. Yeah. You attempted training uh, NERF on a particular object, the fork of a size, and then uh, testing it on say, forks of different sizes, so slightly out of distributions, but maybe out of you know, same kind of object. Yeah, that, that's right. So it's um, generalization between different instances of the same category, I would say, but I, we didn't really push that very far. So it's really generalization between different forks or generalization between different strainers. I don't think that we even tried generalization from fork to strainer. That probably wouldn't work in this case. Uh, I don't expect that would generalize. I don't, but I don't know for sure, just because... Um, yeah, the, the appearance of the fork and the strainer are, 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 are quite different. And like different size forks are just kind of, you know, if you, if you move the fork around and your training data includes like zoomed in and zoomed out forks, then you know, that, that already captures size variation. But how do you actually capture this more complex geometric variation between the fork and the strainer? Yeah, I, I think you'd have to train on multiple categories. You'd have to train on both to do well on new instances. Which category you expect? Within narrow category, I think it would do okay, yeah. Potentially, you could train this, the features, on like 10,000 categories, and then on the 10,000 and first category, it would actually work. Uh, that would be the more like the big data way of doing this, but we didn't try that. Okay, so one, one more project to cover, um, and that's going to be uh, on affordances. And this is why Yenchen's not here, because he's presenting this at Coral right now. Okay, so fresh off the press, uh, so what we talked about so far, at least in the last project, is you can use a NERF or neural field as a data generator, and it will generate you data that can then be used as training data for a multi-view representation learner, this encoder network. And then that's a good representation for manipulation. Okay, so we, we uh, have been thinking about that. You know, NERFs can generate data, but maybe they don't have to generate um, the same data as we could collect with a camera, maybe they can actually generate better data. So this again goes back to that first point I was trying to make, that models are better than your data. If you fit a model to a data, it's not an approximation or something that's worse. You're actually getting something potentially that's better than the ground truth out, better than the real world, which is a weird perspective, but I think it's often true. So a model can be better than the real, real thing, real photos. There's gonna be synthetic photos that are better than real photos. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Okay, so this is a project called Mira with a similar team with a new, few new people, a few of you maybe in the audience, Elon, Weichu, Anthony, and Andy were added to the team. Okay, <laughs> and this is called Mira. Um, so Mira means view in Spanish, I think. So <laughs> anyway, mental imagery for robotic affordances. And in this one, it's a similar task. It's going to be pick and place but with a suction gripper. And again, we're targeting these Objects with complicated optics, transparent, translucent objects, shiny objects, because NERF handles them well, but traditional methods don't. 
OK. So just to demonstrate the task, again, this is uh, like an ice cube, a metal ice cube that you use to cool whiskey. And uh, the system will you know, uh, identify where it is, identify uh, what actions that object affords and where you should take those actions. And then it will do a pick and place operation. I'm going to go into the details of how it works. I just want to show you what it looks like. OK, and you can do these kind of kidding operations. OK. And there was some prior work doing something like that, where they had a, uh, Google had a project where they were inserting objects into a, into a kit, into packaging. But the packaging was transparent, and they had to actually spray paint it with opaque color so that they, the robot could see it. But Nerf can handle these translucent, transparent objects quite nicely. So we don't have to do any spray painting. OK. So, so here's how this one's going to work. Um, the story should be pretty familiar by now. We have a scene with some objects. We want to know where should I pick up that M-shaped object, and how should I orient it to fit through that M-shaped hole. So we're going to do what a human might do. We're going to fit, fit a mental image to this scene. And we're going to imagine in our mental image mental rotation. I'm going to kind of rotate the M and find out where the M aligns with that hole. And then I'll just take the corresponding action that corresponds to my mental rotation. OK, so first we will have the robot just zoom around and, and collect a bunch of photos of this scene. OK, so that's going to look like that. It's just going to take photos of the scene from different angles. Then it will fit a nerf to the scene from those, that collection of photos. This project is now using the even more recent nerf method called instant NGP. So this can be done in about 10 seconds. OK, so every time the scene moves, we don't have dynamic nerfs working very well yet. So every time the scene moves, we have to fit, we have to, again, look at it from a few different angles and then fit a new a new uh, nerf, but that can be done in 10 seconds now. OK. So then once you do that, we can uh, visualize what would that M-shaped scene look like from any particular angle. So here's one, one angle, and that's one view. Uh, we will then try another angle. It'll give us another view over here. And then we will um, take those two views and try to estimate which one is the best view for taking an action, meaning if I take an action in the normal direction to that camera view, which one affords uh, an actual successful pick or an actual successful place? OK, so this is um, inspired by prior work called transporter nets, which did something similar, but only with a top-down camera looking at the scene. So what transporter nets does is it projects that scene into just what the top-down camera would see. And then it runs a convolutional neural network over that top-down view and tries to find, uh, uh, it, it, it tries to predict the affordance of a pick action at every location from a top-down view. So it's searching over two degrees of freedom with a convolutional neural network that's been fit to data indicating where successful pick actions uh, occurred in the training set. OK. And so you can then search over that space with your neural net and pick out the location that has the highest affordance, which is indicated by this hot point here. Really subtle, but there's a little dot of energy right there where it's going to pick. OK, so what NERF allows us to do is generalize that. Now we don't just have a top-down camera, but we have our mental image of any synthetic view of the scene. And we can then pick, we can, we can then apply our affordance model to all of those views, all of those hallucinated views. We do another novel view. We apply our affordance model to that view. We do it for a whole bunch of them. And then we simply compare the affordances between all the views. And here, you can see there's a high affordance right there and not really any affordance in the other image. So we'll compare the best affordance from view one to the best affordance from view two to the best affordance from all the other views. And we will simply select the one that is uh, the highest predicted affordance value. And in this case, it will be the one on the right. OK. So this is the, the best view. And that's the best location to execute a pick action. So the view tells me the normal of the pick, and the location of the pixel in this affordance map tells me the, the planar x, y location of the pick. So that's five degrees of freedom. The sixth degree of freedom comes from simply using NERF's depth map, which tells me how far to go into the scene before executing my pick action. I'll just go until I hit the object. So we look at that pixel. We put it through NERF. We get the depth map out of NERF. And then we have a 6DOF parameterized action of high predicted affordance. 
OK, so that's the whole thing. Um, so then you can, it will search around in its mental image. It will pick at that location. It searches around for the best place. The, the, the direction that affords the best place action, it will place at that location. OK. So one thing I want to mention here, though, is um, Actually, first, let's just look at this. So this is the mental image of the robot uh, and what it's doing. And on the left, that's its rendering. That's the rendering of NERF. And on the right is the affordance neural network that's a ConvNet that outputs a heat map of where I think there are, is high affordance of taking a pick action. And you can see it's just searching over its mental image until it finds a really hot point, And then that will be its pick point at the end. OK, but what I want to emphasize is that you could have done this actually with, a, with just a camera. Like the robot could have a camera and it could just move the camera around, kind of visual servoing style, until it finds the camera is looking at uh, a view that has high affordance. But there's a few things that are better about this NERF representation than just an actual physical camera. This virtual camera is better. So one thing is that it's um, cheap and fast to execute. I don't actually have to move the robot around after I've collected, uh, after I've fit the NERF model. That's one. Two is that it's differentiable. We didn't exploit that, but you could, in theory, actually uh, backprop through this entire system. So you don't actually have to search exhaustively. You can actually hone in via um, updating, like iNERF style, update the pose to minimize the, uh, the affordance gradient. And then three is you can actually take that virtual camera and re-render the scene with different optics. So the photos from the iPhone are all perspective, and you fit your NERF to the perspective photos. But now, the NERF is just a volume of the kind of optical content, the photometric content. It's a light field representation. And you can cast rays. You can reproject that volume into an image with different camera models. And you can do orthographic ray, uh, ray casting to render what would that scene look like with an orthographic camera. OK, an orthographic camera corresponds to moving a camera to infinity and zooming in. And you can't really do that in physical reality very easily. But with the virtual camera, you can hallucinate what would it look like to do that, move the camera to infinity and zoom way in. And the amazing thing about orthographic projection is that um, no matter how far the objects are from the camera, they'll, they'll appear the same size. So moving the objects closer and farther doesn't change their size. And additionally, translating the objects in plane doesn't change their appearance. So with an orthographic projection, my confidence job is just to do this like, very simple template matching. It just has to search for this one shape. Whereas with perspective, I would have to be invariant. I'd have to train a component that's invariant to all the different ways that the objects could look when you move them around left and right and up and down. OK, so you get a big sample efficiency when you do orthographic visualization. And that's something you can do with a virtual camera, but not a physical camera. OK, here's a perspective mental image. And here is an orthographic mental image. And you can kind of see that the objects don't, like they're, just one template for that uh, floss is going to end up uh, being able to fit any of those views, where under perspective, it will uh, the floss shape changes as you move the camera around in your mental image. Okay, the orthographic isn't invariant to out-of-plane rotations, by the way, so it's not invariant to everything, uh, but it is invariant to in-plane rotations or equivariant is actually the word. Okay, so um, I'll just show the success of this method, so you so um, we can quickly wrap up. So here. You have the kidding operation, and it can successfully put this in. OK. Uh, let's see how well it does on a bunch of cases. And you can guess, mm, it's looking OK, maybe. OK, I think it's getting like eight or so, right? Let's see. OK, two, two, two failures, but pretty good. Um, so I don't really want to go into all the details comparisons, but I'll just say that uh, this can do 6DOF, pick and place, and previous methods like TransporterNet only handled 2DOF because they only had one camera looking straight down instead of a virtual camera that can search over the entire um, hemisphere of possible uh, poses. And so those methods, of course, they fail on a 6DOF task. Um, we tried a bunch of things, block inserting. You can see the paper for more details. OK, but I'm going to wrap up. OK. so. Uh, that's kind of the summary, giving robots mental imagery. If we have a mental image, it can act better than having an actual camera. You can, it, it can be fast. It can be differentiable. You can reproject in interesting ways. Uh, so the lesson for me is you know, fit a model to your data, fit a model to the world, and then that model will allow you to do things that you couldn't do before. So I'll thank all the co-authors, uh, including Alberto here. And I'm not sure if any of the others are in the room, but yeah, and thank you for listening.
right. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, great talk. I just have a follow up question. Uh, yeah, I just have a follow-up question regarding the orthographic uh, projection. So to generate that um, like a uh, view, do you just like sample instead of like following the perspective projection, just sample the nerve using like uh, orthographic? That's right. Okay, yeah. so, so you just take the line integral, but in a like um, parallel okay. parallel direction. Yeah. So, so technically, you can also switch to like I don't know, weekly perspective, all kinds of camera models. Yeah, you can. You could do uh, fisheye. You could do anything. And you, you could even be more creative. We didn't explore this, but you can, um, for example, you could render the scene only between a near and far plane. Let's say that the scene is behind some fence. I could just remove the fence by only starting the rendering process after the fence, right? So there's all kinds of things I can do with the virtual camera I just can't do with the physical camera. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Can you talk more about the dynamic? Uh, as you said that you might, you already are working on the dynamic ner nerve thing. Like, what do you oh. mean for that? What is it? Um, yeah, well, we, we really haven't been working on dynamic nerves, but it's kind of a uh, critical technology that we want to use for a lot of, a lot of applications. Um, so there are, there are various projects on a nerf that is not just static, but maybe there's an element of time so you can play the movie forward, or maybe there's even physical dynamics, uh, like Russ had some recent work on um, nerfs with physical dynamics. And in fact, we are following up on that uh, in a certain sense, uh, but not in these projects, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in three projects, you showed us that um, if you take, I don't know, 70 to 30 pictures of the scene or an object, you can then do this mental rotation or mental sort of camera view. But at the beginning of your talk, you showed us one picture yeah. and you asked us to rotate the object and we could do it. Um, how do we get there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so, so one, one thing that I didn't emphasize enough is in one of those experiments in, in the, and I actually had to look at the paper to remind myself, but in that toy car experiment in iNERF, uh, it's one photo that is then input into the pixel nerf, which then infers a full nerf from one photo. That only works because you have a kind of a meta model, like a generative model of nerfs of cars. So this is, this is a system that from one observation of a car can infer what is the full nerf model of that car. But it only works on these toy cars or simple, simple shapes like that. Uh, at the same time, now there's people doing things like um, uh, Dream Fusion is a recent paper, which is like a, um, a model that can take arbitrary text and output a nerf of the object that is described by that text. And there's just, I think, a lot of interesting work coming out on generative models of nerfs where I think that they should enable that kind of ability, that you can look at one thing, and then you have this amazing model of all these other objects in your head, and you just kind of fit that model to the one thing, and then you know what its full nerf is. So just as a follow-up, so that, uh, my understanding is that that implies that that ability will, in your view, will always go through some kind of 3D internal representation. Yeah. Um, versus having an alternative ver model where you just directly imagine, I don't know, to the images or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess this, there's a lot of uh, history to view synthesis. And I think there, were, there used to be this big debate between just 2D to 2D methods and methods that go through a 3D representation. And I feel like the dominant things right now go through a 3D representation in some way. But NERF itself is kind of that, the RGB density grid is kind of a 3D representation. And, and um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a promising way. I don't really think it has to just go from like image to image. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, cool. well, thank you. That's great. Okay, thank you.